But we'll learn more than I think you've ever known before about the battle of Gog and Magog today while answering the question, is Russia's invasion the battle of Gog and Magog? Let's look at this, Ezekiel in chapter 38, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, stop right there, Son of man is a title that God gave to Ezekiel. This is not Jesus This is a title God refers to Ezekiel by this name. Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Okay, here's the first note. The man's name is Gog. Now, knowing the Lord and the way the Lord delivers prophecies, that may or may not be a personal name. I would guess that the name Gog hasn't been seen on the birth certificate in a long, 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 long time in the world. But you know that the Lord prophetically assigns names to individuals sometimes that fit some characteristic about that person. The, the word Gog here is a person. This is a person, a man. The word Magog is the land of that man. So we have a a person, a ruler, and we have the land in which he rules. Gog is the person. The name of the land is Magog. He rules over because he's the chief. There's a word here, Rosh, R-O-S-H, in the original, R-O-S-H, But he's the chief prince of two places named Meshach and Tubal. We find Magog in Genesis chapter 10. We have the occupants of the ark are coming off the ark. And in Genesis chapter 10, they are named the sons of Japheth. The sons of Japheth and the following verses, the grandsons of Japheth are named. Now, we know who these people are. They are named in Genesis chapter 10, and we know where they went. We know the lands that they settled. No matter how you cut it, these people are north of Israel, And they scatter and spread all over the part of the globe that lies north of Israel. And what you'll find here is the word north plays a part in this description of who's coming upon Israel. They're going to march on Israel. The leader of the band is Gog. His own land is Magog. That's the child of Japheth. Okay, off the ark, he went to the north areas. And there's also others involved here. We'll get to that in verse 5 and 6, but it's a confederacy of nations. We're going to name these as Ezekiel did, try and trace them to modern places in the Bible. We, We can do this. And we'll explain then why they do this. What are they after? That's what a lot of people are asking today about Russia. What are they doing? Why would you go to war against this little country? What is it that you hope to gain? Whatever it is that you hope to gain, is it going to make up for all that you're losing? Are you following the news today? Do you see what a Black eye, Russia is receiving. I mean, they are getting, they are getting clobbered on the world stage. Is it worth it? What is it that you're doing? And just yesterday, a some research was done and some opinions given that this, this may be all about trying to regain the borders of the old. USSR, is, is that what it's about? Is it, is it bigger than Ukraine? Those are all fair questions to ask and very interesting, don't you agree? Let's look at slide two. Here's the area that we can look at, and I'm going to move over there 
Pastor John, would you take that black podium and move it closer? I'll spend the rest of my message once I, I'll move. I'll make one move and not more. But let's look at the area and the people that are involved. So all those arrows on that map point to Israel. Now, where exactly is Israel? Somewhere under that red arrow. You can't even see it. Listen, because it's so small. Israel today is a thumbnail compared to the borders of the land that God actually gave to Israel. It's so tiny, that red head of that red arrow pretty much covers the whole land. So what is the big deal about Israel? Why does everybody seem to want to get some piece of that pie of such a tiny nation? Well, the skeptics have, have always criticized Israel as the most hated nation of all nations in the world. What is the big deal? It is so tiny. Well, that little tiny spot on the globe represents my faith in the Scriptures. Hmm? Or at least a large reason why my faith is in the Scripture. Because God said when He started that land that it's going to be here in the end of it all. There are nations in the world today that go to microphones every day saying we're going to eliminate Israel. And yet, there, there it is, tiny it might be, but don't ever, don't ever get an attitude, I want a piece of Israel. Because God himself has backed that little nation. Well, yeah, but they've done a lot of things wrong. Is there anyone on the globe that hasn't? And if you're going to have a confederacy of nations come against Israel from the north parts, where are you going to go to get the identity of that nation? Where do you go? If you go north, straight north, where do you land on the map? Magog, uh, in, in the person of Japheth, the child of Noah, off the ark, went to that northern region, and the children and the grandsons of Japheth spread the globe across Russia today and Europe today. That's where they went. So now we have Gog, the man, and the land of, Ga of Magog, and they're going to come from the north, and they're going to march against Israel, verse 3, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Here they come, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer, verse 6, and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. So there's Ezekiel's description of the man that brings the forces and the satellites that come with him in what we call the Northern Confederacy and they march into war. Okay, so we have Gog, the man. We have Magog, the land in which Japheth and his sons and grandsons traveled. You see what a large area that Russia occupies on that map today. Just to the south and west lies the country of Ukraine. Ukraine. Very small, about 30% of the population of Russia, Ukraine. And that's where those forces have landed today on the map. 
But with that land of Magog comes these nations, Persia. Now, Persia is Iran. Everything in the Bible that happens that's under the banner of Persia, that's modern day Iran right there. Who's next? Ethiopia and Libya together. Now, the word here is foot, foot, P-H-U-T. The word in the Bible is foot, P-H-U-T, translated by English translators as Ethiopia. But the word is burned face, burned face. Uh, there are some smart people uh, who are asking, could, is it possible that would be India? Well, burnt face is what you're dealing with, but the English translators called it Ethiopia, and there is Libya over there. I don't know of any good reason to think that that could refer to any other modern place on the map other than Libya and Ethiopia. There they are, but you'll notice they're, they're from the south, and from the west of Israel. So this confederation that we call Magog and the Northern Confederacy, actually not all of them are from the north. They surround Israel. Is that a good thing militarily when you could surround someone? Now, that's a good thing militarily. When you surround someone, you, you got them covered up. Verse number six has Gomer. That's Germany. Germany far to the west. I need a stick. I'm going to jump and put a finger on Germany. It's right there. That's Germany. That's Gomer in the Bible. Gomer's going to be in that band. The house of Togarma, that's Turkey. The house of Togarma, that's Turkey. They are straight north. Paul the Apostle grew up right here, Tarsus. Today, Turkey right here. Turkey's in the band of people who join Gog and the land of Magog to march onto the mountains of Israel. Verse 6 in the middle, Togarma of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. So I'm going to say that it could be, it could be. That's a great thing to say when we talk about prophecies, when there are things that we don't know. Hey, let's say it could be. Let's do that rather than pontificate and say things that we don't know. Let's say it could be. It could be that there are other countries involved with this confederacy. Just because they're not named by name here, it could be that there are others because it says, and many people with thee. Verse 7, be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee. And be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. And is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. That northern confederacy with Magog is marching against the mountains of Israel. Make no mistake, and we don't say it might be here. This is, this is going to be that this confederacy of nations with many people will come like a storm upon the mountains of Israel. Have you figured out the answer to our capital question this morning? Is this that we see, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the biblical battle of Gog and Magog? Is it what we see today? So this confederacy marches against Israel after many days in the latter years, top of verse 8, and they will come to a land that's brought back from the sword, gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Verse 9, here's the action. 
Thou, that's Magog and its confederacy, shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought. Here comes that evil thought that Gog is going to think in the time. And thou shalt say, quote, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. To take a spoil and to take a prey to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, quote, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou garner, gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Let's stop here. Now that we understand details, hmm? Ezekiel is fairly detailed about what this is going to be. So let's ask a question. What does this invading army look like? Well, they're on horseback. They're on horseback and says here, every man carrying a sword. Is that what you've seen on the news over the last two weeks? Are they on horseback carrying swords? What is the nature of that army? Well, it's been supposed that it could be that this invading force knows that it's so strong and that it so outnumbers little Israel and that Israel is not ready for this at all. In their unwalled villages and in their rest that they're taking, they are so unprepared for this and we are going to cover their land like a storm. We don't need any airplanes. We don't need any bombs. We're going mano a mano, except we're just our mano is a lot more than theirs. We'll do it on horseback the old-fashioned way and take them apart. I don't know about that. I don't even think that, but I'm telling you, this is one of those, it could be statements that sometimes we make. I think it's more likely probably that somebody had a conference in the world and said, hey, don't worry about it. I'd like for you to turn in all your sophisticated weapons because we're going to be a world of peace. So turn in the sophisticated weapons. We won't need them in the world anymore. I think that is a lot more likely because I know who's going to be in charge of the world by the time that thought goes into that man's head about taking Israel down. But what would cause armies of the world to turn in their sophisticated missiles, rockets, and bombs. Who could ever be so smooth to talk an army into turning in their weapons? That must be a really calculated man who wields a lot of power and offers a lot of leadership to the world. And I don't think we have that man on the world stage today. Do you? So here's another question then. Is, is that what we see happening today? Are they, are they invading on horses with sword? Absolutely not. Well, where did they go today? They went, they went to Ukraine, not Israel. Are we forming a conclusion yet? Does verse 11 describe Ukraine today? I'll read these words that jump out. Look at the color Ezekiel puts in. Unwalled villages, at rest, dwell safely, dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. Is that the picture that you've seen on the news? 
Or do you see a fairly fortified Ukraine saying, hey, we got a bad boy coming against us. We better get ready. And we've seen this coming for weeks, haven't we? Everybody in the world pretty much except one man said, Ukraine's about to be invaded by Russia. We saw 150,000 troops around their borders. Is that a description here? So, ladies and gentlemen, let's just say what's become plain to us all who pay attention to what the Bible says. There's not a shred, there's not a single shred of Bible evidence that's what's happening today is the battle of Gog and Magog. Not a shred very extremely irresponsible to say that this battle described in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is what's happening today in the world. They've missed it by a thousand miles. This army of Magog and its confederacy is going to march on Israel. Ukraine is way up there. They missed it by about a thousand miles. It's the wrong time. It's the wrong time. We today don't have the things happening in the Ukraine that are described by Ezekiel in chapter 38. They're not riding horses. They're not wielding swords. It's the wrong time. And it's the wrong place by a thousand miles. This is not Gog and Magog that we're seeing here. Why do they come? Why do they come? Treasure. They want treasure. He says here that Israel used to be desolate, but in the day of this war described in Ezekiel, Israel won't be desolate. It's a desert, the prophet said in the Old Testament, but one day it will bloom like a rose. Now, about 20 years ago, some men wrote a series of tribulation and uh, eschatological books. You may remember these books. There was a string of them. I read them mainly because I wanted to know what people out there are reading. Uh, but I will tell you, I, I frequently said this, this could have all been put into like a book and a half. That that, that twenty four ninety nine at the bookstore is getting pretty expensive just to find out what other people are reading. But that thing was dragged way out, book after book after book after book. And you might remember that in the books that the thing that the invading army was after that made Israel rich was, you remember this? You didn't read those books, did you? Fertilizer, fertilizer. Do you see fertilizer here? Would you have an invading army that involves that many Confederate nations going after a nation that got rich on fertilizer? Now, sure as the world, maybe next week Israel will come out with a new kind of fertilizer and say, we've got, we've got the world's supply of it right here. Come and get some. But this battle is about silver, gold, cattle, and riches. That's what this is. You can see it in verse 13 near the end. Let's pick it up in the middle. They ask a question, art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? So the motivation of this confederacy is they want Israel's gold, silver, cattle, goods, and to take a great spoil. So Israel's going to be very wealthy, and they see an easy target. Now, here's an interesting detail. Israel, in the day of this battle, is, is at rest. They are completely at ease. No bars and gates. They are at rest and peace. Does that describe Israel today? Not at all. This is a different time than what we live. Somehow, in that time, Israel thinks that it has no enemy in the world that could pose a threat. They are at rest and no need to hide behind walls. 
Is that what we see on the news today? Not at all, is it? But what is it we ought to wonder? Amen. We ought to read this and wonder. What is it would make Israel or any other nation ever say, we don't need any weapons. We don't need any bars and gates. Let's just rest because there's no threat to us. To me, that could only happen in Israel if some very powerful person could convince them we're going to have peace treaties all over the world. No one is going to invade you. And I think probably by, by their convincing of Israel, I think someone probably has taken all the major weapons of warfare out of the armies of the world. Who could be so strong to get those kinds of treaties that would protect Israel? Someone is coming on the world scene who is very powerful, who can talk nations into peace treaties like we've never seen before in the world. Hmm? Who could do that? Why would they do that? <clears throat> I think you're beginning to fill in some information in your mind about this big picture setup of that coming time in the world when Israel will be wealthy and yet unprotected. And a massive army will march from the north down and cover the land like a cloud. That is the biblical battle of Gog and Magog. What's the result? Verse 18. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. Uh-oh, somebody's had a bad day now. Someone is not against Israel now because Israel is not unprotected. Amen? Now, this is where you're supposed to get all excited. God says, my fury will come up in my face in that day. When this man Gog thinks that thought of taking a spoil in Israel to cover that land like a cloud, knock it down and take away its goods, God moves. His fury comes up in his face. Verse 19, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother." And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Quick question. Is that a description of what's happening today? Not at all. But it is, it is a bona fide, genuine description of what is going to happen future when Gog and Magog and the Confederacy come against unwalled villages in Israel. So what's the result? God takes up the battle for Israel. There is fire and brimstone thrown from heaven. God shows out totally. There's also here a description about confusion, a lot of confusion, brother fighting against brother. So it seems that among this cobbled together confederacy, there are people who don't recognize their own forces and actually turn their swords on one another and not Israel. So God is all over this. He's going to utterly destroy, uh, skip the chapter division, 
Now 39, verse 1, Therefore thou son of man prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee. And I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured." There's going to be a gathering of the ravenous birds in the sky over the bodies of all the people that are strewn over the land of Israel in that day. You could continue this description in Ezekiel 39 if you are really into the details of this, but I will tell you it's a very smelly passage of Scripture to read. But we've answered the question, is this, next slide please, is this that we see on the news today, the battle of Gog and Magog? You know by now it's not. We have Russia involved with that battle of Gog and Magog, but it's the wrong enemy. It's the wrong destination for that marching army. Also, the time is wrong. On this map, of eschatology, the end times that you see on the right side of that map. Let's try and pinpoint where are we today? Let's see, we have, we have the garden, creation, fall, flood of Noah. We have Abraham, Moses, Israel, the law, then Jesus Christ coming. Then we have the, the death of Christ on the cross, his resurrection, the day of Pentecost, we believe is the beginning of the church age in the Bible. This is the golden age in which we live. We know it started at Pentecost when the Spirit was given to the church, and we know that it ends with an event too. That event's called the rapture, when Jesus Christ himself comes to take his church out of earth. He's going to come in the clouds, not all the way down to earth. He stops in the clouds. There's a trumpet blast and the shout of an angel and the church will rise. Amen. Is that good? Is that good? And so the church then in its whole will be wrapped. It's not a rupture. It's a rapture. The whole church goes, the church meets the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words, says the Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. Is that good? Is that good? And so we ought to talk about the rapture. We're supposed to comfort one another with these words. Now, there are a lot of views about the rapture today. You've heard some of them, no doubt. I hope that you'll agree with me. I hope that you will land squarely in the camp where I so proudly occupy my place, that is in, in the camp of those who believe that the rapture is pre-tribulational. That is that the church leaves before the fire of God's wrath falls on planet earth. And there are other views that have been cobbled together that have the church down under the rapture as the wrath of God falls. But the Bible says that we've been saved from the wrath to come. Amen. We are not going to go under the rapture because we don't belong to that crowd of people that rejected Jesus Christ. The church is made of believers. Now, you could be a Jew or a Gentile or a Cherokee Indian, but if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are a part of his church, neither male nor female, nor bond or free. It just doesn't matter who you are. If you're a believer in Jesus, you're a part of the church. And our amen... And our day here is coming to a close. We don't know when, and we have no signs for it. Are you listening to me today? Matthew 24 is not full of signs for the church to read so that we can know when the rapture is going to happen. That is not at all. It never has been, and it's never going to turn into a passage of Scripture that the church can read and know when Jesus is coming. That passage is for Israel. And that passage gives signs that are happening during the seven years of tribulation that Israel can get ready for the coming of their king, Jesus Christ. Hmm? 
Well, I'm telling you, it's, it's very different. We believe that the battle of Gog and Magog will not happen during the church age. Another end time movie was made. It's about time for a new one to come out with all these that are happening. Please don't let Hollywood give you your eschatological beliefs. We've got to stick to what the Bible says. And if you see something the Bible said that different than anything I ever tell you, reject what I said, please, and take what the Bible says. But this battle of Gog and Magog doesn't fit the church age. It doesn't fit. Ezekiel never wrote to the church. Ezekiel is an Old Testament prophet of Israel. Look up here. Israel essentially was shelved by the working of God. They've been put on the bench. They didn't receive their Messiah. Their job was to carry their Messiah to all the families of the earth, but you can't carry the one in, in whom you haven't even believed. Israel was shelved, and God introduced the church into the world. Ezekiel was not writing to the church. He's writing to Israel. Therefore, what he described in this battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is a description of a battle that will not be fought during the church. It will come after the church when Israel is again in the focus of God. Is that good? Is that good? So there are some that say the battle of Gog and Magog will happen at the end of the church and, and we'll, we'll have the rapture imminently about to happen. It's not at all my view because the Old Testament is not writing about church. The Old Testament's writing about the coming kingdom of God, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ in the world at a later time. So I'm telling you that my faith says the battle of Gog and Magog happens during the seven year tribulation after treaties are signed with Israel and a lot of other countries in the world that bring a worldwide peace for a while. That peace gets shattered by Gog and Magog. There will be two major movements among the nations of the world in that day. There will be a rebuilt Roman Empire. And then there will be Gog, who's doing a different thing. The Antichrist has signed with Israel a peace treaty. It eventually gets broken and the Antichrist will turn against Israel but there's going to be a lot of activity in the early stage of that tribulation with two major world forces playing against one another. A rebuilt Roman Empire. The iron and clay mixed together down in the toes of Daniel's image. And then there will be Gog and Magog bringing a mighty force against Israel who is protected by the Antichrist. So we have this battle. There's some practical questions we need to ask. Is it Russia, Ukraine today? No, not a shred of evidence for that. Could it be some kind of, of uh, preparation for that? Well, now we can't speak to that. Could we see the next slide, please? But this is what's happening today. You see, here is Russia today. You see the, the mammoth of the land of Russia. By the way, there are godly people inside the boundaries of this nation today. There are, there are godly people. We should pray for this country. We should pray for that land and for its people that as many of them as possible believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that they not be among the army that one day will march against God and against Israel to take a spoil. We should pray for this country. We should not consider them an enemy today. We should consider this, this land of people to be objects of our prayer that as many of them will believe in Christ as possible. But today they've marched against that little country over there, that little independent country of Ukraine. Israel is off the map. This is today. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is then. And there's not a shred that ties them together. Could this be Israel's beginning salvo to end up with Israel? We can't speak to that. What we're speaking to is that Israel, uh, that Russia's 
invasion of Ukraine is not Ezekiel 38 and 39. Where they go from here, we don't have a description of that in the Bible until they march like a storm against Israel. Why does all this matter today? Why, why, did, I, why did I spend a, a precious preaching time on this battle of Gog and Magog? When some people have never, never seen it in the Bible, maybe some have never even heard it. Why is it important to spend this time? Well, two reasons. Number one, here's a lesson in conclusion jumping. Ladies and gentlemen, there are people out there who would stand on their head or cut their throat to get likes on the Internet, to get a news camera on them, to give, to, to, to give some news that no one else is telling. But you cannot jump to conclusions whenever somebody mentions a place that's in the Bible. Let's not get all carried away. Sure as the world, there's a preacher right now saying this is the battle of Gog and Magog, and there are people who are going, yeah, 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 let me get my wallet out. This is a lesson on conclusion jumping. We can't go there. Let's use what the Bible says. And clearly the Bible points to the fact this is not Gog and Magog. Number two, <clears throat> we need a general understanding of the end times. Are we going to be taken away, carried away by a lot of nonsensical things? And eventually that will be used to attack the reliability of Scripture. Every child of God ought to have a simple understanding of what's about to happen in the world. And I will tell you, when you study, what you'll find is what's going to happen in the world is the rapture. All eyes are on the rapture. Don't look for signs. Look for the rapture. That triggers everything. That's when God kicks over the first domino and they begin to fall all over the world. When the tribulation comes, thank God, I'm not going to be here. Now, if you are, give my best to the Antichrist. <laughs> but I'm not going to be here because I'm going up in the rapture of the church. Amen. So this is why it's important that we know some of the battle of Gog and Magog. Where's the USA? Is that a good question? Where's the USA? I'm going to give you some good news. All, all my life in trying to understand from the time I was a boy... When I read a very discouraging uh, piece of literature asking, where's the USA in the end time prophecies? And all my life I've looked at this and I've seen opportunistic preachers write their stories and their guesses about where the USA is, and yet I can't find it in the scripture. But I want you to see this. Would you put up, back up my um, timeline of God in the world? Here's why this is important. The whole history of the United States of America lies inside the church age. The whole history of the United States of America as a nation lies inside the church age. Therefore, we should never expect Ezekiel, Daniel, or any other Old Testament prophet to tell us about the USA, since the church is not their subject. I'm trying to make you happy. Don't expect to find the USA listed in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel's not writing to the church. He's not writing about the church. The church was hidden in God to the Old Testament writers. Could that be why we don't see the USA in the end time prophecies? I think so. Am I saying that the USA will be here during the... How can you speak of that which you don't find in the Bible? I don't know where the USA will be, but I'm telling you, don't expect to find the USA in the Old Testament prophets because they're not writing about church. They're writing to Israel then and Israel in the kingdom. Hmm? Russia will never rule planet Earth. Russia will never rule. They will attempt to take in Israel in the battle of Gog and Magog. They will be defeated and destroyed by God. They will rise again to have a second battle of Gog and Magog. That will be a thousand years later at the end of the millennium of Christ. That confederation will be defeated also. But Russia is not going to rule the world. God named four world rulers. Russia is not among them. And when they come in the latter days, they will be defeated by God. Here's another question. What do we do? What do we do? 
Well, number one, we need to be the friend of Israel always. Genesis chapter 12, when God called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees and told him, I'm going to use you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to send you like a unit of God out into the world and your uncountable descendants to carry the blessings of God to all the families of the earth. He said, whoever curses you, I'll curse them. Whoever blesses you, I'll bless them. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America in its place in time and geography has always been the friend of Israel, and we have been phenomenally blessed by God. May the USA ever be the friend of Israel and not come under the cursing of God. If the USA turns against Israel by God's word, the USA, like others, will be cursed under God's judgment. So that's what we need to do as, as a people but now what do we as the body of Christ need to do? We need to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to as many people as possible. The rapture is going to happen before the battle of Gog and Magog. The rapture happens, be, that is your last opportunity to ever get the gospel to any living person. And the rapture of the church could happen before you eat lunch today. That's not a prediction. It's a statement of a possibility. We need to do everything we can do to carry the gospel to other people in the world before the rapture happens and the coming judgment of God falls across our world. People need the Lord. They're out there now terrified at what they see on the news. They're afraid that there could be nuclear action. You know this, don't you? It's a great day. It's a great day to speak for Jesus Christ in the world. Hoping somebody will say amen. And let me share this with you. If you've never understood it before, God loves you just the way you are. God has shattered human history. This is documented when Jesus Christ came into the world. Why did he come? He said, I've come to seek and save that which was lost. Who was lost? All of us. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Jesus Christ came into the world to get us. How would he seek us? How would he save us? He went to the cross for us. He went to die a horrid death on the cross. Why did he die on the cross? He had no sin. He's holy God because he bore the sin of ours. Our death penalty was what he carried to the cross. He died an awful death. It took him six hours dying, rubbing his splintered back up and down a bloody cross for six hours until he died literally with a broken heart. And three days later rose from the dead. He took your sin, your death, your hell, and bore it in his own body. Three days later, walked out alive. You could have everlasting life by believing in him. This is the good news of the Bible. Watch this. Let that hand represent you. Let my wallet represent our sin. There we are. There's God. We're separated from him because of sin. But now this is what God has done in Christ. Jesus came into the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus bore all your sin, little sin, big sin, past sin, future sin, all of it born and paid for in the body of Christ at the cross. Three days later, he had put sin away, risen from the grave, and thrown, has thrown the gates of heaven wide open for any to enter in who will come in by faith alone in Christ alone. The barrier has been removed. Your sins have all been paid. And now you could have everlasting life by trusting in the one who redeemed you at the cross.